loves the Holy Spirit. He's taught me so much about the person of the Holy Spirit and to welcome him in, in, the, in the life of my life and the life of this church. So we get a bit privileged to hear from him. Uh, John Paul's going to pray for him and then we're going to hear from him. Yeah, um, it was just beside a picture in the worship of two coffee urns, um, the ones out there. And I, I think it's fair to say I've never actually thought about coffee in the worship, just in case you're wondering. And, um, and one of the, the coffee urns now has this sign that says strong coffee. And I just thought as a picture of today that we want to, um, as a picture of the Holy Spirit, is kind of like that. Do we want strong coffee or the weak coffee? Okay, so, you know, hospitality team, thanks for, you know looking at people's preferences. But I think I just want to pray for us now that we will desire the strong coffee as uh, Norman brings what he's prepared. So, Lord God, I thank you so much that you long to be with us, to be with your people, Lord, and you are a God who comes in our midst, Lord, and makes yourself fully uh, manifest, makes yourself revealed, Lord, and that you are, we've just been singing it, Lord, we want to have your presence here and so lord i just pray as norman preaches words that he's prepared lord and you know so much uh, about you know your, your work in his life lord i thank you that this man stands next to me having seen the goodness of god and seen your spirit move amongst people so lord i just pray a blessing over what he brings lord i pray that your spirit will be working in our hearts as he speaks lord and that we will desire we'll be thirsty for strong coffee lord uh, stuff that you know even wakes us up lord when we are tired lord when we we come into your presence that we will be transformed so lord yeah let us not just want a little bit of you but let's wholeheartedly go after you amen okay well if you'd like to get your bibles open um i'm doing the second part today of um of, of prophecy uh, unfortunately the first part uh, wasn't recorded i don't believe uh, but um, uh, so I, I'm just going to do a, a sort of little resume. Um, uh, but uh, first of all, let's have a look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians 14. And just going to read uh, the first three verses there, Joel. If you'd, uh, uh, and it says this. This is Paul speaking. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to people but to God. Indeed, nobody understands them. So they are utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, their encouraging, and their comfort. Last time, that was really where I concentrated at looking at what those three words meant. Um, strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And I won't go through that again. But today, I'm going to be very, very practical. Um, I'm going to talk about actually using the gift of prophecy. And I'm going to look at it under three headings. I'm going to look at it under revelation. In other words, the knowledge that God gives us that we might prophesy. I'm going to look under the second heading of interpretation, which is so important. What does this mean? How do I interpret what has just been brought to me? And thirdly, application, the wisdom to apply a prophetic word wisely. And those are areas where in the past there have been all sorts of pitfalls in Christian churches. So revelation, interpretation, and application. But first, a little resume. First of all, we want to say this, that all prophetic words, which is somebody speaking out what they believe God has given them, they may actually act it out, depending on, I suppose, their character, but they're bringing something that God has said to them. And the motivation for that has to be the love of God. It has to be, I want to convey to others the love that God has for them. If that doesn't exist, as Paul says uh, earlier, he says, uh, if we don't have the love of God, then we're like a sounding gong or a clashing cymbal. We make a lot of noise and a lot of exhibition, but actually we miss the point of the love of God coming through. So prophecy has to be motivated by the love of God. And it says elsewhere in Revelation 
that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, our, when we're speaking, we should be bringing a, a testimony, as it were, of what God has done in our lives and is doing in our lives. It should be exciting and full of thrill. And um, as I say, we looked at these definition of strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And one of the ones I used on that and under strengthening was the whole sense of when we first come to Jesus and we ask him to be our Lord, we are actually requiring him and asking him that he would strengthen us. Because the Bible is quite clear that unless he comes into our lives, we are in darkness, as we've been singing today. We are lost. We're without hope. And yet, God comes with his message of salvation, with the grace of God that uh, allowed him to be on that cross for you and me, that we might be strengthened and know why we're alive and be able to live lives that are fulfilled, knowing there's a reason for being here. And so, let's have a look at these three things of revelation, interpretation, and application. How does revelation come? What we mean by revelation is, how does that knowledge of what God wants to bring to, to people, to a situation, how does it come? Well, I'm sure the list could be massively longer than I'm going to say. But I'm going to suggest some of the ways I've seen people stirred by God to bring prophetic words. Um, I've heard people say, I just had these thoughts in my head. Suddenly, these thoughts came to me. Well, thoughts, thoughts given by God. Have you ever really looked at John chapter 4, where Jesus meets the woman at the well? He was a man like us, and yet he was fully God. And in front of him is a woman who is in desperate need. She's a lonely woman. She's, she's actually come to draw her water at the middle of the afternoon when no other women would be there. Because in a sense, perhaps she's disgraced about the way she's been living sexually. We don't really know the background to her. But Jesus looks at her and knows her heart. And he sees into her soul. And yet, and he has a word from the Father for her. Which is going to build her up and strengthen her. And, uh, but he doesn't go charging in. And destroying this woman with some, hey, the way you've been living is not good. He actually, first of all, he whets her appetite with speaking about the water that he can give. Which isn't like the water she's about to draw from the well, which is going to satisfy her for the day. But he speaks about the water that he can give, which will satisfy your thirst forever. And she says... Give me some of this water. And he says, with his word that God has given him, go and call your husband. And she, at that moment, is allowed the freedom to confess her background without pressure. And she says, I have no husband. And he says, that's right. In fact, the man you're with now is not your husband. And he lists the others that have been with her. And she says, I can see you're a prophet. But he is doing something in her which is saying God knows about you and yet God wants to bring life into your soul. And I, I love it. She, it. When she's had her conversation with him, she rushes back to the town that, or the village that she comes from and says, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. I think there were some men that probably didn't feel too happy about that. But it says most of the village went to find this Jesus. See, this is the word, of the testimony of Jesus. That's what prophecy is about. It's to build us up, to strengthen us. Sometimes, as we mentioned last time, a house is falling down. It needs to be underpinned. That's the strengthening sense. Sometimes it just needs to be encouraged as a person. Come on, press on. Sometimes we need to be comforted. Is I was thinking that was right, but I didn't know whether it was right. And a word comes that helps us to understand. 
So just thoughts, but given by God. How easily we ignore this. I'm going to go into dreams. We find it in the scriptures. Dreams um, that people have. I, I, I rather like the idea of dreams because you can't manufacture dreams. I mean, I suppose you could eat loads of cheese before you go to bed, but I don't think that will produce it. But dreams that are from God that you wake up remembering. And you have to sort of sort out what are the cheese dreams and what are the dreams that God... The, the, God, the God-given dreams last. And there's a sense of revelation that comes to you when you had a dream like that. I've heard of people having dreams for other individuals and then uh, sharing that dream wisely. I'll talk about this in a moment with uh, a, a, another couple. And actually they said that is exactly right. This person had seen something in their life. And, and, and actually, the, uh, they were about to, to split up, but, but this dream helped them to realize that God wanted to be involved in their situation. Visions. We read about that in the scriptures. I, I don't quite how we describe visions. I suppose I'd say a vision is having a dream while you're wide awake. You sort of, uh, you just suddenly see something, as it were, in the spirit. And... Uh, If you're not a Christian here this morning, you might think this is really strange. What are these people talking about? Listen, there's a whole world that you don't know anything about. It's the world of the Holy Spirit. It's the world of the living God. It's the world of the one who said, let it be. And it was. And he wants to involve you in that too, even today. So visions and dreams. Sometimes it's just scripture. You know, it happened to me just last week. I'm working my way through um, the Old Testament and um, I came across a a very unusual verse. But it it so struck me that I underlined it and wrote a little thing in the margin and and, and thought about it. And then I was with somebody and they were just sharing with me their their situation, a Christian person sharing their situation with me. And I, I almost felt like God turned the light on and say, you could share your verse that you read this morning. And I, and I just, but actually, when, often when we bring in these prophetic words, we don't have to say, I have a prophetic word for you. We don't have to go strange. I, I just said, actually, I was reading a verse this morning, and this is it. I wonder if that might help you in your situation. And I'm blessed to say the person said, that's interesting. I, I've read that verse in the past. Uh, I'll meditate on it and see what it means for me. So there are lots of different ways, I'm, 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 and others of you have got other things. I mean, if you turn with me to 1 Kings 19, sometimes we always want all the excitement. But when you get to 1 Kings 19, you, you, you meet um, a man who loved God, and uh, he'd been serving God, and uh, his name is Elijah. He'd been serving God, he'd been seen the sacrifice uh, uh, consumed by the power of God uh, against the, the prophets of Baal. And he's, and he's run away. He's, he's scared. He's, he's fallen into depression. And uh, he needs the presence of God. And uh, I'm just going to read to you from 1 Kings 19, verse 11 onwards. It says, uh, <clears throat> so he meets with God and he, he wants to know what God's got to say for him. And it says this, verse 11, The Lord God said, Go out and stand on the mountain. In the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? I I love that little, it just explains another way in which God speaks to us. But often we think, oh, it's got to be cataclysmic, earthquake, fire, and But actually, because God is a God of love, and he loves you and me, he says, a a gentle whisper. And so, to understand how we get this revelation from God, we have to be attentive to what God is doing. 
And that means almost quietening our own soul. I mean, we live very busy lives. We're rushing here, rushing there. But actually, God says, I want you to come aside at times every day and just spend time in my presence. It doesn't have to be hours. I do that, honestly, <coughs> by walking my dog. I get out in the woods. I've got two dogs that, that behave themselves, so I don't have to worry too much where they are. And I, I just, often I just speak in tongues, I pray. But I, m- most of my sermons come from the woods. That's where I find God speaks to me. Now, you, there is a way that God wants to speak to you. It might be different. It might be, I don't know, lying in a luxuriant bath. You know, God speak. Whatever it is, find that way where God will speak to you because he wants to speak to you. And so this thing of revelation, there isn't a great uh, list that I could, you could probably, others of you could add other things, but God wants to speak to you. Can I just say something over this? None of these things of God speaking to us prophetically is supposed to be a substitute for common sense. I've met Christians that, oh, I need, I need to know this, I need to know that. Well, use a bit of common sense as well. But hear from God and let him speak to your soul. I think you know, actually, during worship this morning, I felt the presence of God very strongly. And it's almost like, it's almost like being hugged by God. And you just sometimes, isn't that right, with husbands and wives or children or whatever, just a hug is all you need. That's what God is wanting to do, to bring his prophetic word into your soul, to light you up. So I just want to say something about uh, bringing um, prophetic words. Um, When you bring a prophetic word, and I am a bit emotional and I do wave my arms, so I'm I'm going to speak against myself in one way. If you've got something to share with others, um, it's best shared without great emotion. Because I remember in Seven Oaks, we had a lady, and whenever she wanted to bring something in church, she would go, and and so many groans, I just think, I don't know what she's trying to say. It would be so much better if she was just quite supernaturally natural and said, I feel I've got this I want to share. Also, um, I think that the person who's bringing the prophecy must be willing to be accountable if what they speak to somebody, and we'll talk about this in a moment, and, and it doesn't come true if it's not right. They, they, they're allowed to say, actually, I brought that and I've, actually, I realize it hasn't come right. There has to be an accountability to what is brought, it, particularly uh, if, it's not, if it earns not to be true. Uh, and that honesty can, can bring an authenticity to the, to the ability to bring a word from God. And as I've already said, don't always say to somebody, I'm about to bring a prophetic word. Uh, Jesus just spoke normally to that lady. And, and there are loads of other places where Jesus used the gifts of the, of the Spirit. By the way, did you notice the way he used wisdom with a word of knowledge? The word of, the word of wisdom was to say to her, bring your husband, let her come forward and, and, and approach God. So that, that's happened in other places in the scripture. If you look at the way Jesus deals with people, if you read through the first few chapters of Revelation and see how Jesus speaks to the seven churches, you'll find there's great love and mercy in the way he corrects as well as encourages. Read them through for yourself and say, God, could you use me in this way? And I would say, if you've got a word from God, don't embellish it. You don't have to add to it. Just say it as it is. And let it stand. If it's a word from God, it will have the effect it's supposed to do, which is to strengthen, encourage, or comfort somebody. Just let it stand as it is and let God do what he wants through it. Smith Swigglesworth, who uh, I can say his name today. I've obviously got my teeth in. I couldn't say it two weeks ago. He says this. He says, anybody using a gift of the Spirit... Uh, uh, sorry, whenever a person uses the gift of the Spirit, those that are listening to him should be left with a sense of awe for Almighty God, not awe for the person bringing it. In other words, what was it John the Baptist, uh, what did he say? Um, He must increase and I must decrease. So it's not about us. It doesn't, it's not like a, a certificate of how well you're doing spiritually because you can do this whether it's speaking in tongues, prophesying, or whatever. Actually, they're gifts of the Spirit. They come from Him. 
We are simply the means by which he wants to speak them out. <clears throat> Just give you some example. At the end of my foundation classes in Seven Oaks, um, I would always bring in a little team of prophetic people that I'd been working with. And uh, do you remember two weeks ago I talked about Sheila, who had a, wrote down a, a word about coming to a place with cobbled streets, which is here, and pushing a cart. And I won't go through all that again. She was the one. And on, uh, just give you an example, how, another example of how she brought prophetic words, which is so good. Uh, I'd said to her and, and four or five others who we'd been working through with, we often met together, prophesied together, prayed for each other, and all that sort of stuff. I considered them a little team that I had great confidence in, and I'd bring them into the end of my foundation class to see if there was anything that they wanted to say to the people, because I wanted people who came into the church to be, as it were, baptized into the things of the Spirit. And um, she came in, and uh, so I said, uh, uh, you know, have you got anything to share? And she started rummaging in a handbag. And out she brought a packet of sunflower seeds. I thought, hello, where are we going now? And she said, I was just walking around the supermarket, and then she walked up to one of the ladies in the foundation class, and she said, I believe God wanted me to give you these sunflower seeds because he loves you very much. I don't know quite what they mean, but she gave the sunflower seeds to this lady. And the lady just bawled her eyes out. She just wept and wept. But it was a good weeping. And we said, when we prayed for her, and it was very powerful, I mean, hardly anything had been said. So I've got this packet of sunflower seeds. And what emerged was that this lady, when her son... Her son, at the age of 16 or 17, was killed riding his motorbike. At the day of the funeral, she came home, and from her kitchen window, there's a lovely wall, and she planted sunflower seeds so she could remember and be thankful to God for the son she'd lost. I mean, you know... Listen, this is the effect of this. If we will just allow the Holy Spirit to blow through us. It was a wonderful moment. It was, and it was extraordinary, and it was unlikely, and that's how God is. Let's have a look at interpretation then. What about interpretation? You know, the interpretation of a prophetic word is not always obvious at the time. And I would say that the person that brings a prophetic word is not the best person to interpret it either. Because there is a tendency to want to add to something. But, um, uh, but... If, a, if you're bringing a word and it's a word from God, you can ex, uh, or uh, you're receiving a word and somebody's brought it to you, uh, you, you can expect it to be confirmed by other ways or other means. I don't know if you remember, but Mary, when uh, at the, you know, what we call Christmas time, and the, this whole load of shepherds had all come flying down the hills with their bags and their, and all going, we've seen angels, we've seen a host of angels. I mean, the poor lady, she's only just given birth, and they're barging into the, you know, the, the room, and she's going, we've just seen angels, and this, um, and this child you have, and they start to speak about what the angels said. Do you remember this, about uh, the, what this, uh, this Jesus would be? There's a little, when, when they've all gone, and I'm sure Joseph and Mary went, whoa. Um, when they're all gone, it says, there's a little, in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, it says, um, Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, I think that's a, a very good key to what to do when a prophetic word comes. You may not be Mary. But if somebody brings a prophetic word to you, or you feel God's spoken to you, hold it, ponder it, treasure it up, and say, God, if this is right, would you confirm it in another way? Last time I talked about how the Sheila had brought that word about coming to a, a town um, with a cobbled streets and so on. But if you remember, um, it was confirmed long time later when I'd for, I didn't know what it meant. I hadn't got a clue. And the car and I were just up the road and we came to Bury St. Edmunds and parked and said, there's cobbled streets. Let's see if there's a river and a bridge as well. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's what I talked about last time. It takes time. God's got time and he will confirm things. And so it may be confirmed by circumstances, which is exactly what happened with us. 
in that we had this word, this picture that we didn't understand, came here and suddenly went, oh, cobbled streets. That's exactly what Sheila said some two months or three months earlier and it encouraged us. So we can ponder things and hold on to them. And a word that is accurate should produce hope in the hearer, in the person. Uh, that, and also, even if it's a corrective word, maybe pointing out something that isn't right, it should produce a way out of the problem. In other words, it doesn't p produce somebody hanging there. If you look at the way uh, Jesus spoke to the seven churches in Revelation, he said, you know, I have this against you, he said to one of the churches. But actually, he all the time is showing them how they can come through that against you thing into life. Because God intends to build us up, not knock us down. The difference between the Holy Spirit and the evil one the, who, is that he wants to condemn us. But Jesus wants to free us. And that's the difference. So the word, if a prophetic word comes, it should bring freedom. It should, even if it, we're being told, you know, like he said to one of the churches, you've lost your first love. Nevertheless, it should correct us. It should underpin us so that we say, right, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to walk in a different way. Because God's saying there is hope. And for each person, each of us, there is always hope in God. The world would love to condemn us, but God always wants to build us up. So in interpretation, it needs to give time. Um, I'm just going to give an example of something I read in the book I've been reading by Mike Bickle. He talked about a guy who uh, he, he prophesied accurately over this man. And um, he said, um, well, actually, what he said wasn't accurate, but what he saw was right. And he said to this guy, um, I believe you're going to learn to play instruments and you're going to go throughout the world and your uh, music is going to be the big thing. And the guy's going, what? What? He was completely confused about it. And um, Mike Bickle said, he went up to this guy afterwards and said, what did you actually see? So he said, well, I saw this guy and I saw music notes above his head. So he said, uh-huh. Why did you add all that extra bit about you'll learn to play these instruments and you'll go throughout the world? He said, well, he said, it, I thought it was the obvious interpretation, but it confused the person. But actually, the answer was the man ran a music company. And he was is tone deaf, but he ran a music company. And it was just God saying, actually, I'm going to spread your, your company throughout the world. Now, uh, because I've explained at the end before the beginning, um, that might seem a little bit confusing. But I, I, what I'm saying is don't embellish what God gives you. Say it as it is and leave it there, but also make sure that the person... One of the things you can say to somebody, if I bring a, a word to Andy, I can say, Andy, does that mean any sense to you? It gives him the opportunity to say, I don't understand it at all. I could say, okay, maybe I've got it wrong. Then I walk away from that. But if it does turn out to be of any sense to you, then come back and encourage me. Do you understand? It's, it's not a tightrope we're walking. It's actually allowing God to speak. Now, what about application? I've just wandered into application already. But um, application has to do with waiting, pondering, meditating, looking for confirmation from other sources. I believe if God speaks to you about something, he will confirm it elsewhere. There's something in Scripture that says when, you know, that sometimes God says, God said this again. He says it twice. When God says a thing twice, he means business. So, uh, wait in application, think, what does this mean? What does this mean in real life? Um, prayerfully looking for the confirmation from other people who don't know anything about it is very helpful. I mean, I don't quite know what I think about this, but Joseph, he was only 18, and he had this, um, this word that, he was going, that his parents would bow down to him and, uh, you know, all this. I mean, he did rather blurt it out, didn't he? And it didn't work out well. I mean... I, I think he would have been wise to keep it to himself. And then I was pondering and thinking, yes, but if he hadn't been thrown in the pit, he would never ended up where he ended up. So I don't know how God would have worked it out, but I do think he was a little bit unwise in perhaps just the way he shared it. Maybe he should have taken his dad aside and said, I don't know what this means, dads, but I, I had this prophetic dream that you were going to bow down to me. And his father put have said, he might have had some wisdom on it, but he also said, you know, I should keep it yourself. Don't tell your brothers just yet. I, I, I don't really know whether I'm right on that, but all I'm saying is 
We do need wisdom the way we share things like that. And we must give room for it to be wrong. In the Old Testament, if a prophet got it wrong, he was stoned to death. Don't do that in the New Testament. In the New Testament, actually, we just say, does that make any sense to you? When Sheila wrote down the prophetic word about coming here to me, I said to her, does it mean any sense? She said, uh, do you know what this means? She said, no. I said, nor do I, but I put it in my notebook and kept it. And actually almost forgot about it until the day, oh no, I should have told you, Morris Nightingale, when I'm on holiday, appears for breakfast one day and says, would you like to come to Bury St. Edmunds? I said, no, I don't want to come to Bury St. Edmunds, thank you very much. And it was then that I looked on a map and saw where Bury St. Edmunds was, and then I came here and saw the cobbled streets. So I'm just trying to explain to you, it doesn't all fit in the pattern we want. It's God allowing us to uh, take time to ask him, would you make this clear to me, please? And Can I just say this? If you've had prophetic words over you, the sovereignty of God doesn't mean that it's automatically going to happen. There has to be that cooperation with us. I've written this down. A prophetic word is an invitation to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. May I say that again? A prophetic word is an invitation to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't automatically come about just because you've had a prophetic word over you. Um, but if you were, we won't look in it now, but in Acts eleven twenty eight, a guy called Agabus, he prophesied there would be a famine. And the people in the church said, in that case, because they knew he was reliable in the things he shared, in that they started to take an offering. And, and so that actually when the famine came, they were in a position to be able to feed those who needed feeding. And, it, and it, if you look in um, uh, Acts eleven twenty eight, it says, and this famine took place in the reign of. It was actually confirmed. So uh, a prof- the application means that we actually cooperate with God uh, in order that it would take place. Can I tell you, this is a prayer I've been praying. It's a prayer I got from Mike Bickle, uh, from his book that I've been reading. And he said he prays this regularly, and I found it so helpful. I don't pray these exact words like some mantra, but it's what I say to God on a regular basis. Lord, what are you saying or doing at this time that you want me to participate in? Isn't that a simple prayer? Lord, what are you saying or doing at this time that you want me to participate in? And when I meet people, when I'm walking my dog and so on, I'm often praying that, Lord, is there anything, that I, I put it in my own language, is there anything I could say in this situation? Is there anything this person might say to me? I try it. I, actually, what I'm doing is this. Now, you know I s- used to sail a boat. I've sold my boat now, but I used to sail my boat. You know, sometimes you, 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 you're going to go for a race on a boat and you put your boat in the water and there's no wind at all. You think, how are we going to race in this? But if you don't get out in the water at the starting line, you won't even start the race. You'll be disqualified. Actually, the way to find out where the wind is is to put your sail up. You put your sail up, and when you put your sail up, sometimes even when it's such a still day, you can't even believe that there's any wind at all. You just see a fluttering at the end of this. So that happened in the Old Testament. Do you remember, I don't know where it is, but it says that wait for the sound of God moving in the balsam trees. I'm not quite sure what a balsam tree looks like, but that, you know, when they were to advance. Listen, if, if you want to grow in this, start putting your sails up. If you don't put your sails up, the boat can be in the water, you've got a rudder, you're all ready, but unless your sails are up, you'll go nowhere. So just put your sails up. Putting your sails up is like praying this prayer. Lord... What are you saying or doing at this time that you want me to participate in? Notice the word participate. That's why I brought that other phrase. A prophetic word is an invitation to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And so if you've got trouble hearing from God, some of you would say, I don't think I've ever heard from God. I think you have but you didn't put your sail up to see the effect of what he was saying and to get that sense, the wind is blowing. And it's coming from this direction. 
Our responsibility is to be attentive and listen to God on a regular basis. May I just be practical in here? Attentive when you're praying. So you just don't come with, Lord, I want this, and Lord, I want that, and Lord, I want this, and Lord, I want that. Say, Lord, would you speak to me? Some of the best praying is done by not saying anything. It's just being still before God. Are you saying something, Lord? Let him take your heart and your mind and let him blow on it and start that fluttering in your heart. When you're reading your Bibles, let him speak to you about what you're reading. Listen, I've been reading my way through Numbers and Numbers has got pages and pages of names. And I, I was very tempted to say, oh, I, oh, I'll just skip to the end. But actually, I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. God wrote these names for a reason. I'm just going to read through them all. And in amongst them, uh, there were little things that I made, um, highlighted, and it's all in my Bible. And I've written notes because God, sometimes he speaks to us when we least expect it. So when you're reading your Bible, or when you're praying, listen to God. Make notes of things. Please do. Let the whispers of God come. And then articulate what he said. And say, God, when's the opportunity for saying this? Is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is there a situation coming where this will be useful to me? I'm just trying to lead you into this. Because God is very interested that we should actually bring Strength, encouragement, and comfort to people around. And that people should know that there is a God in heaven who loves them. Can I just finally say this? It takes humility to walk in God's anointing on his terms. On his terms. It takes humility. And, and oh, I said finally, but here's another finally. Particularly like in this scene of a Sunday morning. Not everything you hear from God while you're, say, worshipping together should be stood up and shared. Sometimes what you've got is a conf confirmation of something that somebody else has already prayed about or, or spoken about. You can go to them privately and say, actually, I confirm what you said. Maybe there was a tongue and interpretation and you had the same. You don't have to stand up and say it. You could just say, actually, I can confirm that. Because... It's, it's, it says in the scriptures, if you read it, it says, when one is prophesying, they can sit down, another can stand up. It's supposed to be the body working together. So we walk out of here thinking, as a body, we've heard from God. When I, 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 Terry, when I was working in France, Terry Virgo used to, after, I, I, I would go with him and do some translation for him and things like that. But if we were away on a Sunday, he'd be on the phone at, at one o'clock talking to his wife, and he'd be saying this, what happened at church this morning? What happened? And we talked about it. He said, I always expect something to happen. Don't you, Norman? Don't you expect something to happen? Don't you expect God to break in? Don't you expect people to be helped? Well, if we don't, why are we here? I expect God to be speaking to us. I, I am thrilled to see our children beginning to just flutter in the wind of God. Aren't you? Um, Shona, thank you so much for bringing that interpretation of a tongue this morning. Otherwise, I had to do it. It's what it says in the Scripture. But thank you, and I agree with what you brought. There are times when we've looked in other directions, and, and oh God, I'm so sorry for that. Thank you. Let's, let's encourage one another to grow in God. I'm finally finishing with my finally final. final. <laughs> Can I ask you, have you... I'm going to pray for two groups of people here. I'm aware it's after 12, but I didn't start till half past. <laughs> have you actually asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? Have you committed your life to him? Or are you still on the outside saying, I... Yeah, I appreciate there's a God, but can I really ask him into my life? You can. You are allowed to say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. You are allowed to say, thank you, 
that you died on the cross for me. When he died on the cross, if you will cooperate with him by asking him to be your Lord, he will move you from death to life. It's a promise of God. And you are allowed to, so you're acknowledging before him your desperate need. You're confessing your sin and saying, I need help. Like that woman at the well. She was honest. And you're inviting him to be the Lord of your life. If you've not done that, I want to encourage you to do it today. And I'm standing up, and I'm, I'm not going to take a long time here. I'm going to ask you, if you know God's speaking to you with his still, small voice, he's knocking on the door of your life and saying, will you let me in? He is doing that because he wants to come in. And he's thrilled when you open your life. You might find it embarrassing, but he's thrilled when you open the door to him. Now, if you haven't done that, I'm going to invite you in just a minute to stand up where you are. And then I'm going to ask everybody else to stand up with you. And I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. I don't know who's here, but God knows who you are. If you are here and you say, I've never really asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life and clearly asked him to forgive me for my sins, then now is the opportunity for you to respond to him and let his Holy Spirit blow on you is there anybody who now wishes to stand i am standing i'll give you about 15 seconds if you'd like to join me i will be most grateful and then i will ask everybody else to stand okay everybody else if you want to move and hear God's voice more often, if you want to launch out, if you want to get your sails up, maybe you've already done this for years, but you still feel, I want to go back to this. Some people, after I preached last time, a few people came to me and said, I used to prophesy, but I seem to have lost my way, or I haven't done it for a time. Yes, I know exactly how you feel. Busyness of life gets in the, gets in the way. But listen, with God, there's always a way back. He's always saying, oh, I'd be so thrilled. So if you are responding to anything I said this morning, will you please now stand with me? And would you put your hands out to God, please? Holy Spirit, will you please come on every person who's standing or sitting if they can't stand, Lord, and with their hands out. Holy Spirit, we want to be a church that demonstrates on a daily basis the power of your kingdom. We want to demonstrate the personal nature of our relationship with you. And we want to bring strengthening and encouragement and comfort to those around and we want to bring the testimony of Jesus to people so that they may have all sorts of ideas about God and not that, and, or, or not God. But Lord, we want to be living witnesses of those that have been in his presence. Now I ask you, Holy Spirit, blow on us. Now I know God's speaking to some of you. Just agree with him on what he's saying to you. He's inviting you to move out, take courage. Father, keep blowing on people. I pray that even as they go from here, there might be something new happening in their lives. So that, Father, the church... This church, other churches might have this ministry of reconciliation, of bringing hope to people who don't think there's any hope, strengthening, encouragement, comfort. Come, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Some of you are just getting your sails up and God is beginning to show you there's a fluttering. He wants you underway.
now? Would you just commit yourself to giving some time to hear him? It may not happen at this moment, but as you go from here, would you just commit yourself to him? Say, Lord, I'm going to carve out some time just to hear you speaking to me. And would you pray that prayer? Lord, is there anything you are doing or saying at this time that you want me to work alongside you, to cooperate with you in? If you'll pray that prayer on a regular daily basis, when you're in front of people, I am sure he will give you things that you can say that will bring strengthening, encouragement, and comfort to people and see people move from darkness to light. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we thank Norman, please? <laughs> we'll, uh, we will bring our, our service to a close, but um, the, uh, what, what Norman shared is, is what he, car he carries this, and um, this is something that what we have here is very special in terms of uh, uh, contributions and, and gifts of the Spirit, and, and um, I just want us to really pursue this. The Bible says we are to, to earnestly desire to seek to prophesy, to seek the spiritual gifts, and there's some really good practical ways there to do that. So Norman, I'd be grateful if you could make those notes available. Uh, people work through the notes, work through the scriptures, and it's wonderful to see new people bringing contributions that, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are beneficial to, to build us up. So let's just seek those things. Thank you, Norman. And uh, Father, I just want to thank you for this morning. Father, I want to thank you for everybody who served us this morning. Thank you for your presence with us. And Lord, I want to send everybody here. Why don't you stand with me and we'll send you into the week. Um, Father, I just want to send everyone here, Lord, to be your body, Lord, wherever we go, in our families, their friends, Lord God, and help us to be a people who, who seek uh, your presence in our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can pick up your children if you have them. Teas and coffees. Let's hang out. Let's talk about stuff. <laughs>